joined now by Jamil Smith, who's a senior writer at Rolling Stone. Jamil, how are you? How are you doing now that we're we're recording this on a Friday? We're a week after uh, the, the the election has ended and all the uh, the chaos that ensued. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, certainly, you know, considering the result, uh, I think I'm doing a lot better. Uh, when it's, <laughs> I think I certainly can't turn my brain off still, uh, you know, certainly with the Georgia runoff coming up in January, uh, still a lot of work for us as political reporters to do. Uh, and it's a lot of work for America to do. Uh, we all have to remain conscientious. We all have to remain uh, tuned in and vigilant. Uh, you know, certainly the president is, uh, is testing our patience uh, even still. But I think that, you know, it's important for us to remain focused on what the incoming Biden-Harris administration is planning to do and how they're set up to do it, uh, especially if, in fact, the Democrats do take the Senate. Yeah, I mean, that Georgia runoff is going to be huge, right? And, you know, obviously, I wanted to have you on today because you wrote this great piece called Another Reason We Can't Breathe uh, in Rolling Stone a couple of weeks ago. But when we think about, you know, addressing environmental racism, actually addressing environmental justice, so much is going to come down to, the, you know, votes in Senate, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I wanted to step back before we kind of get in, into the details of that, because it's it's just clear following your career and seeing your work that you know not only care about climate and environment you know as as a great writer this is also also something you're very passionate about i know you've worked with uh, climate reality and and the in the past why be you know beyond just as a writer why 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 do you care so much about climate and environmental issues well, I grew up in the city of Cleveland, born and raised, and you know, of course, this is the city that is known, unfortunately, uh, for our river catching fire. I mean, this is something that you know were the butt of jokes uh, for you know the Cuyahoga River back in the uh, you know 1969 uh, catching on fire because of industrial water pollution. So this is something that I'm very familiar with from even a young age. Uh, my city that I love being known for its uh, you know environmental hazards. Uh, that being said, I'm also you know acutely aware of you know environmental dangers because of lead poisoning you know in 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 my neighborhoods and that I grew up in. And so I'm I'm very very aware of how you know certainly disadvantaged uh, folks uh, you know. African-Americans in particular are affected by environmental dangers that are inherent to how and where they live. And so I wanted to make sure that in my journalism, I'm you know, taking account of how these factors play into uh, the, you know, certainly the disproportionate uh, disadvantages that they suffer. Uh, you know, as you know, we, we talk about education, we talk about um, all the other different uh, things that uh, affect us, uh, you, know, you know, in daily life. We talk about police brutality, we talk about incarceration. All these things are, you know, relate back into environmental dangers. And we yeah. need to talk about how, uh, you know, the, the neighborhoods these people are coming from um, affect their health outcomes, affect their very lives. And so I think it's really, really important. We think about places like Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Uh, we think about the lead poisoning, uh, you know, in neighborhoods, not simply just Flint, but also, uh, you know, places like Cleveland and Detroit, uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, these, these neighborhoods that are suffering silently while we think that they're actually on a level playing field. It's actually not the case. Well, and so much of that comes down to proximity to polluters, right? And you wrote in, in that piece, Another Reason We Can't Breathe, um, you wrote, uh, quote, a 2017 study from the NAACP and Clean Air Task Force found that because Black Americans were 75% more likely than average than, than the average American to live in communities close to industrial facilities, they were 38% more likely to be exposed to polluted air than their white countrymen, unquote. You know, Joe Biden in his acceptance speech on Saturday said that, uh, you know, when he was when the campaign was at its slowest, that the African American community stood up uh, again for me. He said, you know, um, if, if President elect is to uh, Biden is to uphold that promise, what does he need to do specifically to address environmental racism? Well, I think first things first, I mean, I think. The Joe Biden presidency, in my view, is really going to be about triage. I think it's really going to be about uh, bandaging up uh, a lot of things in America that are broken. 
uh, broken specifically by this Trump administration. Uh, and one of those things is going to be reversing the, you know, approximately 100 uh, regulations and rules that this administration has rolled back, reversed, and I think what we're going to be looking at is how quickly uh, the Joe Biden administration can act without Congress yeah. to move on environmental uh, actions. So can he, you know, do what he needs to do without, say, the say of Mitch McConnell, should, in fact, those Georgia races not go the Democrats' way? Um, we're looking, you know, at, at how you know, quickly he can do this because it's really, we have a pandemic going here. That's a, we're talking about respiratory illness. Here, yeah. You know, and a lot of folks here are dying because they have been disproportionately, uh, you know, not, not simply born like me with asthma, but also, you know, you know, affected as they've grown up in these, you know, poisonous environments, affected by asthma, heart disease, diabetes. Um, all these different afflictions that are making them more susceptible to COVID-19. So we've got to act quickly here. And it's not simply a matter of financial stimulus uh, or um, you know, other forms of aid, though those are important. We've got to act quickly to protect the environment and to change these uh, regulations that are benefiting private industry over uh, our public. Yeah, you know, part of what we liked on on this podcast, and I think, um, activist groups. One reason they got behind uh, Joe Biden was, you know, his plan, his plan on climate and the environment. And I know, you know, he addressed environmental justice in his plan. I know you took a look at that for your piece. What did you make of uh, of his climate and environment plan when it came to specifically addressing environmental justice? I thought it was very comprehensive. Uh, I felt that it was, uh, you know, certainly for a plan coming from a candidate who had been criticized very heavily by, you know, some, you know, further left groups like the Sunrise Movement. I thought it had come quite a long way uh, in terms of his environmental uh, awareness and specificity uh, with regards to addressing things such as, um, yeah, I would say, you know, waste removal. I'd say, you know, in terms of, you know, being a part of that larger $2 trillion proposal, I would say it was addressing um, very aggressively you know, the, uh, you know, in terms of like investing in African American and other disadvantaged communities, um, we're saying we're going to be, you know, addressing climate change with, you know, with you all very specifically. And we're saying, I think it was, uh, if I'm getting the number wrong, please correct me, 40% of yeah. the overall investment you know, from this administration is going to be in these disadvantaged communities, right. uh, in these communities that have been disproportionately uh, affected by uh, these forces that have exacerbated climate change. We are going to put all, of, you know, this heavy investment in, our, in your communities. That to me says we're taking this seriously. We are trying to balance the equation uh, from, uh, from, you know, from it being imbalanced over so many uh, you know, years and generations. That to me says that we're we understand that the problem can't be solved in a four year term, but we're doing our best to reset the terms of the equation. And so that to me says we're t at least taking this seriously and we're going to take the proper action as needed. Now, first of all, you know, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement is is important. Um, bigger steps, broader steps are, are are needed, but these kinds of specific actions are what tell people that they matter and in its age where you know we where black lives matter is 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 not just simply an organization it is a it, it is something that we have got to you know come to live by uh it is is important that the new president uh come to embody those words in his actions and not simply in his rhetoric yeah and i think you know one of the things that i really liked about his plans not only you know are we investing 40 percent of that into frontline communities but also there's a lot of community autonomy right the role of the federal government is to help right. provide that funding and reverse frankly a lot of the things the federal government has done in the past to create these kind of frontline communities that have been overexposed to pollute, but also allowing a lot of autonomy and communities to do what they know to, to best address these issues and i know you know i know you spoke to policy analysts, lawmakers, environmental justice act activists about President-elect Joe Biden and his approach to environmental justice. Were there any 
recurring themes or recurring responses you heard when, when people were, were describing uh, Joe Biden's, uh, the, the, what he might do on environmental justice? Well, certainly the all, you know, all of government approach. I think that's something that, uh, you know, Dr. Robert Bullard uh, mentioned uh, when describing this, uh, the all of government approach involving all sectors of the government in, in environmental justice solutions. I think it was very important, not simply saying, okay, we're gonna get the EPA on the case. No, we're also gonna get the Department of Education on the case. We're also gonna get the um, Housing and Urban Development on the case, Health and Human Ser Services, all of these different areas of the governmental bureaucracy on the case of environmental justice. That's incredibly important because we're talking about, uh, you know, the environment in schools. Uh, how are we going to keep our kids healthy? Um, we're talking about environment, obviously, in you know places like you know public housing. Uh, these are all things that we have to be thinking about, uh, you know, in, in a very conscious and forthright manner, so that we're not trying to play catch up later. We're not trying to figure this out generations from now. How do we fix this? How do we ameliorate what's been done wrong by the government, or what you know? How do we uh, catch up? Um, this is something that, you know, government has to have some sort of foresight uh, to avoid building into its systems this kind of racism so that we're not saying, oh, well, we didn't mean to produce these racist outcomes. We didn't, we didn't intend uh, to, you know, produce an, in, in this kind of inequality. Well, you may not have intended to do this, of course, but that doesn't excuse the actual result. And that's what people need to understand. It's not about intent, it's about effect. And you need to plan for the effect uh, so that the intent is irrelevant. Well, I think in just a broad sense, if you have leaders in place with an interdisciplinary approach to these issues that are leading these agencies, if you appoint people in, 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 in leadership positions who actually understand that, it's going to be really helpful. And I know you spoke to Dr. Robert Bullard for your piece, and I saw where Andrew Revkin, the, the former New York Times reporter and Columbia professor, he mentioned Dr. Bullard as a, as a possibility to head up the EPA. I don't know where that's going to go. I, I think that would be awesome. Uh, how important do you think it will be for Vice President Biden to nominate someone like Dr. Bullard or someone with a background that has actually worked with these frontline communities that really understands environmental justice? I think it's incredibly important. I think if it's not, you know, Dr. Bullard, it's incredibly important that uh, the president-elect uh, and the vice president-elect for that matter, uh, work with people who are, you know, been on the ground, who have been in the courtroom, who have understood how to uh, litigate these cases, who have talked to the people who are experiencing uh, these kinds of traumas, um, and who understand what it is to uh, fight this fight. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, you know, Joe Biden hasn't, you know, fought this fight himself. You know, he's, he's certainly, you know, been you know, one of the, at the foreground, at the forefront, I should say, of this fight, you know, in, during his time in Congress. Uh, you know, it's, and Kamala Harris also, you know, putting forth environmental justice legislation of her own. These are two people who are not unfamiliar with the fight for environmental justice. However, it is important that they get in touch with people who are understood what this means on the ground and understand what this fight means on, on a practical level. And that being said, you know, that you know, they understand, I think to some degree, you know, from, a, from their positions as president and vice president elect, the intersectionality of this from a you know, policymaking standpoint. But I do think that it is important that they have folks like this because there are some holes in this plan. I mean, you know, black farmers are not mentioned right. in this plan, um, as we know in the piece. Um, you know, there is a gender lens, uh, I think, that is a little bit missing in this plan, um, as, as has been noted by some critics, including in my report. Um, I think that there is a way that Black, you know, the strife of Black women and the disproportionate effect that uh, climate uh, change and other uh, uh, environmental uh, traumas have on Black women has been uh, I guess not, maybe not given short shrift in this plan, but it at least needs to be more explicitly addressed. I think that, you know, obviously having, you know, someone like Kamala Harris, you know, at the forefront of this administration helps, but, you know, I think representation only carries it so far. We need to see certainly policy and rhetoric, um, you know, from this administration early, and we need to see it, uh, you know, you know, taking action, you know, to reverse the very dramatic, uh, regressive steps of the, the 
the Trump administration. I think, you know, if we're looking at the legacy of the Trump administration overall, I mean, there are a lot of negatives to go through. We could be here all day, but I think, unfortunately, the most lack, the most lasting negatives of this administration may be with, you know, with climate. Yeah, you know? and that's that's saying a lot. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And we know, I mean, just studies show when you start talking about environmental racism and environmental justice, it really, I mean, even for the average American, it really motivates them to want to take greater action. And I, and I, and I, and I love that you, you know, you've written about this. You mentioned that before that Dr. Reverend William Barber has talked explicitly about the need to, to undo these environmental harms as a part of of racial justice. You know, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, we obviously saw worldwide protests against structural racism and state sanctioned violence. And then, as you mentioned, we had COVID, right? And we saw how the disproportionate effects of COVID were, were, were hitting communities of, of color. How do you think this, the, the, all of these events coming together in 2020 may change how people think about environmental racism? Uh, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, you, looking at just even when I was down in Atlanta the last year with the Climate Reality Project introducing Reverend William Barber on the stage, <laughs> you know, he was there training uh, uh, people who are trying to become activists and, and volunteers in their own communities. Uh, and he was there with uh, you know Vice President Gore trying to help them uh, understand and get trained to you know go out and lead in their own communities and. and and there was, was ironically, a man who's trying to become senator right now, uh, Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock, you know, and they all were there because they understood, in my opinion, the importance, the centrality of this struggle to the fight for civil rights. You know, we talk about civil rights and we hear a lot of stuff about criminal justice. We hear a lot of stuff about police brutality. We hear a lot of things about, say, housing even, which is all very important and, 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 and it's all things that are essential, but we don't hear um, is the, the, the civil rights battle, um, you know, about in the environment. You know, we, Dr. King talked about environmental justice a lot and the environmental justice movement owes a lot to Dr. King. He may not have called it that. He may not have, you know, said, okay, this is it. used, I'm going to use this specific term. But, you know, when he fought for the, 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 work, the workers in Memphis to get better working conditions, <laughs> you know, so that they're not breathing in toxic fumes, um, you know, and having, you know, health risks on the job, that is environmental justice. Absolutely. Okay. You know, you, when you're trying to get sanitation workers, better working conditions, that's environmental justice. So we need to be thinking about this more broadly. We need to be thinking about um, you know, this with the with an eye on the term that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw coined, intersectionality, understanding how these different systems of oppression feed upon each other and work together to, to, to make things worse. And I feel like there's almost no area of, uh, I guess, policymaking that, that, that really brings it all together quite like environmental justice does. Absolutely. But I mean, one of the issues were that in, in, in past decades, people like Dr. Bullard weren't getting, and, and so many other environmental justice leaders, were not getting the prominence that they deserved in mainstream, large environmental and climate groups. And I know you spoke to uh, former Vice President Al Gore about this, and he said, well, that's changing. I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing. And I, and I, in, in uh, according to the former vice president, environmental justice is now at the center of the environmental and climate movement. What's your assessment of that? Are you seeing the same change? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, certainly in my years working with the Climate Reality Project, and certainly in my years following this uh, this movement, I've definitely seen it change. At least from a rhetorical standpoint, people become you know, you see it changing because people are more comfortable with the vocabulary. People are more, un, you know, when people become a little bit more comfortable just even talking about it. Um, you have to understand that people, there's, there's action behind those words. There's, there's people taking action uh, in their communities. They understand the, 
you know, the urgency of things. So they understand, the, you know, the urgency to learn the language. They understand the urgency to understand, uh, to, to comprehend the challenges within their communities and, and to, uh, and, uh, to, to find ways to confront those challenges. Um, now, in my journalism, I'm trying to, uh, along with my, my Rolling Stone colleague, Jeff Goodell, um, we're trying to figure out ways to you know, cover this issue in a way that, you know, frankly, gets people interested. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, as you do all know, uh, there's too many folks, I feel like, unfortunately, in this our, in our media consumption universe who hear climate change and they tune out, you know, and I remember working in cable news, we had the same problem. Uh, you know, do a segment about climate change and they tune out and we need people in, you know, who are out here watching and listening to this stuff and reading to say with their dollars and with their attention spans that this is important. So make sure that if you're listening out here, make sure that you, that you, if you click on these links, that make sure you listen to these podcasts because it's important that you speak with your attention spans. Um, it, it really does matter. Um, that you that you that you take the time. Yeah, but I mean, let's be honest. You're one of the most prominent writers when it comes to politics and culture, and obviously, you've done television and and digital and print. You've done you've done it all, Jamil. So, what as someone who's covering so much when it comes to our political culture, what are some of the keys to getting people more interested in understanding how climate relates to them? Because I do think even if you know, even though uh, many people may want to tune out, part of the reason is it is a hard topic to approach because it can be a bit scientific and it can be a little hard to approach other like other other than uh, some issues that you 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 see more visibly in, in your life in your life. So, what are some of the keys to to encouraging more people to get excited and to want to address these issues? Mark, I think that's a really good question. I think it's it's important to help people understand what makes this relatable to my life. What makes this uh, something that I need to pay attention to right now that makes this simply not a, a poverty porn, uh, that makes this simply not uh, something that the media is going to cover for a few days. Uh, and then, you know, once they, you know, they get tired of it, they're, they're going to leave town and, uh, and, my town is going to become a synonymous with tragedy and death and misery uh, and black pain. This is something that you know folks want to avoid. I can understand that. You know, when you hear the word Flint now, what do you think of? Yeah. You think of dirty water. And I can understand people wanting to avoid that. But I can also understand the desire for people to get their story out to have people pay attention to the, the, the injustice that's, that's, that's occurring. And, and I, it's part of why I started you know, in this business in the first place is because there are too many people out here whose stories are not being told, who aren't being paid attention to. And, and you know, they are dying silently. You know? And it's simply, uh, uh, it simply has to stop. It simply has to stop. So many people have been complicit in that silence. I mean, we even like you know, I was thinking about the presidential debates. We hadn't had a a question on the environment or the or the climate in twelve years. You rarely get so questions about the environment on debates. And you know, during the final debate, Kristen Welker asked about people of color being more likely to live near oral, oil refineries and chemical plants. And that was the first time I can remember in my life hearing a question specifically about environmental racism. When you're watching that unfold and, and to see environmental racism discuss during the debate, what are you thinking? I mean, I could, I, I, there was part of me, you see, you know, having, you know, worked, you know, not say alongside Kristen, but certainly in the same company as Kristen and having, known her reputation uh, during my days at MSNBC. I wasn't surprised, but there's a difference between shock and surprise. You know, I think people need to really grasp that. So, we, you know, folks out here saying, oh, I'm not surprised by this thing. Surprise is a useless emotion in this, in this business. We need to uh, let that go. But shock, shock overtook me when I heard that question. And I was, I was like, whoa. 
all right now, okay. Um, I, I was shocked in all the good ways that you can be shocked. And I, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't expect anything from the president on that, um, except for him to be, you know, to pat himself on the back. But I definitely was, uh, you know, listening for, um, for the you know, vice president's answer. And I, I was, I was more wanting to see how public would react to that as well. And I want to just, I want to keep hearing more. I want to hear more and more detailed questions about these, about these kinds of policies. And frankly, I, I, we really do need to hear more from Republicans on this. Um, I really do thirst for a, an opposition party response to this. You know, this is a party that has, you know, consistently, um, essentially, you know, thrown governance away, the responsibility of governance away uh, for the opportunity to use their positions of power to benefit private industry. Uh, and and they, they have sacrificed our health and the environment in the process. We need to have them answer for that. We need to hear what they are going to do to either make up for that or to, you know, to change, you know, to change their direction or we need to hear them answer for it. One of well, the two. In that debate, President Trump didn't answer the question. He was asked specifically about the environmental rollbacks that were leading to people in these communities Christian Walker was talking about getting more sick. And he didn't answer that. Instead, he pivoted to talk, talk about uh, employment numbers and wealth gains. And I know you were, you were, you were right. specifically critical of President Trump in your piece, um, talking about you know during his reelection bid, he releases the platinum plan, which was aimed at black economic empowerment. And you wrote about that plan saying it you know, didn't cite anything about environmental racism. What did you make of the, the platinum plan when it was released? Well, the platinum plan is just this vague list of, you know, it's, it, oh, well, let me, let me restate. The platinum plan is, is this imitation of the, what we, we've seen in the past from politicians. It's, it's almost as if this, you know this cosplay of what we've what we've seen from democratic politicians in the past it's almost that you know the trump campaign saw what democratic politicians have, have tried and failed uh to do with with black audiences in the past and they just said well we're just going to do a, a, an even you know lesser version of that we're just going to just have this like basic very basic you know list of vague promises that mean absolutely nothing and we're going to send that out and we're going to call it the platinum plan, which makes it sound like it's a, a you know, a, like a health insurance option. And, and then we're going to, you know, send it out and think that that's going to satisfy, you know, them. And, you know, it, it honestly, it felt like scraps of, you know, scooped off the table uh, in our direction. That's what a platinum plan felt like when I when I first looked at it. And frankly, that's how the Trump administration has treated black people uh, during these past four years. And and they got a vote percentage uh, that you know was commensurate with that treatment. And and that and and frankly it was poetic justice that a you know that cities like Detroit and Philadelphia and Atlanta and Milwaukee, uh, heavily black cities uh, with the heavily black vote uh, were in fact the last, you know, seemed like the last stroke that you know, seemed to pretty much clinched uh, Joe Biden's victory because um, they uh, they were sick and tired of being the sick and tired, you know, as as as, <laughs> as yeah. the old folks in my family used to say. Um, we are um, we are tired of being insulted. We are tired of having our intelligence insulted uh, by an administration who thinks that. Uh, you know, a few, uh, you know, pitiful uh, gestures towards civil rights uh, will make up for the uh, you know, blatant and deliberate uh, regressive moves against us, uh, both regard with regards to uh, the environment and with regards to our actual rights, um, you know, with regards to laws and whatnot. Um, we're tired of being insulted. And uh, frankly, I think Democrats need to pay attention to, to that as well, because it is, it, we're not going to accept that kind of treatment from them as well. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to accept that kind of treatment from them either. Um, the Trump administration simply took 
the kind of you know patronizing treatment the black folks have received from politicians and they almost did some kind of like insulting like clumsy act performance of it uh, they almost did some kind of clumsy performance of it it was it was almost like they deliberately tried to insult us for four years and i mean frankly i mean this is this is a guy who's been racist since the 70s publicly you know out 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 in the open and so i don't you know this is what we expected yeah you mentioned the democrats there's all of this in fighting now with you know after the election they didn't win as many senate seats as they expected they didn't win as many house feet seats as they expected and i'm hearing a lot of talk about uh moderation and messaging and i feel like a lot of that's going to come around to how we're fighting for a green new deal what do you when it comes to democrat democrats fighting for environmental justice and, and more aggressive climate plans how do you see them resolving the, some of the, the fractures within the party? I mean, frankly, we got to talk about what white voters want. You know, white voters, you know, have got to want this. White voters have got to want a healthier planet over racism. White voters have got to want, uh, you know, environmental justice over their feelings being satiated by, you know, this you know, charlatan or these kinds of politicians who don't actually serve them uh, beyond making them feel better. Uh, white folks you know, voted, you know, both men and women for four more years oh, yeah. of, a of a president who isn't doing anything to end a pandemic that is, you know, infecting more than 150,000 Americans a day right now. Okay. They voted for four more years of that. So, We've got to, you know, forget about messaging. <laughs> we got to ask white voters, the majority of them in this country, what they want. You know, do they actually want a, a planet that's inhabitable over their, over their, over their, you know, over their feelings, over their, <laughs> that's, just be perfectly frank about it. Like, that's really what we need to ask. That's what we need to figure out. Because Democrats, you know, the, the worst thing that they can be doing right now is sitting there being like, well, you know, defund the police and, you know, turned off a bunch of voters. I mean, <laughs> come on, guys. Like, it's not that, okay? It's not that, okay? It is not deep. It is not that. It's not about that. It's not about defund the police or socialism as a message or sloganeering, okay? It's about the fact that the majority of white voters in this country don't care about governance. <laughs> I don't know how you fix that with the proper message. You, you've got a bigger problem on your hands right now. And, yeah, and the problem is, is threatening the planet. Yeah. Threatening our ability to, to, to live on this planet. So actually, let's be perfectly frank. The planet's going to be fine. The planet's going to be here. <laughs> it's our ability to live on this planet. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> well, one of the scariest things was after, you know, after that great moment, Kristen Welker asked that great question, what's the conversation after debate? It's like, oh, is Joe Biden going to end fossil fuels? Like, we are going to end fossil fuels one way or another. The mark, you know, it's, it's going away. And it was just so troubling to not hear the conversation. Like, the fact that that was like a gotcha moment was so upsetting to me, Jamel. I was so pissed to see that that was the conversation afterwards. And just a reminder that like, whether it's people, whether it's people in journalism, whether it's a Republican party, a Democratic party, we really cannot be playing with some of these communities that are relying on fossil fuel jobs. If we're not like figuring out ways to transition in a, in a way that is just, like we are just, we are just like playing people. And that was so upsetting to me. Yeah. I mean, I'm, as a person who's born and raised in the Midwest, I mean, people don't even understand how dangerous fracking is. People don't understand how, like, this stuff destroys the land that people live on. It, will, it, it causes earthquakes. <laughs> it poisons the, the soil. And, and it, the idea that we would continue this practice just so we can continue to win elections is asinine to me. And so... You know, frankly, look, if, if Joe Biden needed to say that in one debate, maybe so that we can get rid of a guy who was going to end democracy in this country, maybe, okay, fine. 
but you know, <laughs> like get busy figuring out ways to transition these communities immediately away from these fossil fuels, get these people understanding that, that they can survive more and thrive better on green economies than they can doing what they're doing now. I mean, I, I, I've, I grew up in Ohio and you know, I'm right up the road from West Virginia. I, my mother's from Pennsylvania. I, these communities can thrive much more efficiently and better with green economies than surviving doing fracking, building these pipelines, continuing with coal. The coal industry is continuing to die in the trunk. Faster. they voting for this man. Faster than during the Obama administration. I don't think a lot of people right. know that. Right, right. It died faster under Trump and they still voted for this man. And that's not because he's going to continue to bring the coal industry back. So let's not make it about that, okay? Let's not pretend that it's about that, okay? So let's understand what this is really about and understand that people are willing to sacrifice their very own physical health and the environment around them, the land that they live on for their own insecurities and their own cultural comforts. That's a problem that we, if, if we care about this environment and want it to get better, that is a problem that we are going to have to confront and solve. And and those of us who are not equipped to solve that, solve that problem or confront it, you know, within our own families, <laughs> we're going to need those of you who are to get to work. Absolutely. I know we talked a lot about climate and environment. Just to wrap up here, when you think back years from now, what are you going to remember about writing about this, uh, this, this last election cycle? Wow. Um, I am going to remember... Um, the, I, the just, Rob, I'm going to remember the fact that this president, for all of his faults and for all of the very dangerous things that he did, I think the one thing that we can take away that may be beneficial for us as a country is that we had our eyes open to the holes in the boat so to speak. We all were made very aware of the things that are wrong with America, the things that, you know, were, you know, inherently flawed in the American project. And the things that, you know, were built into the ideas that the founders put in, and also the things that we have yet to correct, um, that are going to present challenges for us as we you know continue on in the world that we live in and the, the challenges that we have created for ourselves including current climate change are going to require us to think differently about the country that we live in and, and but they're not necessarily going to require us to sacrifice the liberties that we hold dear and these are things that we need to make sure that we emphasize. And that to me is really at the core of it. We, we can still be the America that we cherish while also solving the problems that are, that are in front of us. And even if we cannot end climate change, we cannot actually solve the problem, um, we can certainly make this a more um, habitable world. We can preserve that for ourselves while also uh, preserving uh, the liberties that we cherish. That's a great way to go out on. Again, Jamil Smith, you can find his writing at Rolling Stone. You're at Jamil Smith on Twitter, at Jamil K. Smith on Instagram. We will link to these pieces as well as your social media handles in the show notes. So you're absolutely one of my favorite writers. Thank you so much for doing the show, Jamil. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.